This is a production of Cornell University. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today to talk about native plants. Um, this cover photo kind of shows uh, the, the three prongs of my work, which is looking at landscape adaptability, propagation, and production in containers for, I don't want to say new native plants because they're not new to the planet, but new to the horticultural industry. So, so I'm going to say novel, novel native, native uh, shrubs mostly. And the reason why I started, uh, or I guess um, my work with natives started with my dissertation work on invasives. So for my, my doctoral work, I looked at the contributions of cultivars of Japanese barberry and winged euonymus to invasive populations. Because at the time, um, the state of Connecticut was facing um, bans. They were enacting a voluntary ban on Japanese barberry cultivars with high fruiting. And they were looking for safe alternatives, particularly native plant alternatives. And um, kind of did wanted to get away from barberry. I was tired of the thorns and the scratched arms and fingers. And the thorns will last for months under your skin. Um, I may still have some coming up, and this is a long time ago. And um, but the question was, you know, can can natives fill the gap left by Japanese barberry cultivars that are incredibly tough and can grow in parking lot islands and high light, high heat, high pedestrian pressure, salt runoff. They can propagate and grow in containers very easily. So can you have native shrubs that can do the same thing? One of the first uh, plants that I looked at um, was nine bark because it was a direct replacement for barberry, purple foliage cultivars, yellow foliage cultivars. Um, probably today, the one of the few or only direct replacements for a purple barberry is still this plant. I could think of there's some purple, red, and orange leaved deer villas now, but they're really more southern natives. And we looked at um, powdery mildew susceptibility and the cultivars that were available at the time. And we had yellow foliage cultivars and purple foliage cultivars. And we found that the older cultivar nanus with smaller leaves was largely resistant to powdery mildew. And this paper actually is probably one of my most cited papers. We, um, very useful to not only plant breeders and scientists, but also you know, nursery growers and, and landscapers. And from this work, a lot of breeding was done to develop new cultivars. This is some of the new cultivars since that study, and a lot of them have natives as a parent. So um, using that resistance to breed in for better landscape plants. I think this is the cultivar Donna May at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, which features a lot of native plants. If you're into native plants, it's worth a visit up there. So uh, wrapping up the nine bark work, I started to think about other native plants. And there were a, a good number that were widely used, very important landscape plants like winterberry holly and the creeping juniper, viburnum dentatum, red twig dogwood that were popular, important native plants. Um, but overall, it seemed like native plants were uh, being overlooked for landscape potential. And this is a trade show display showing the proven winners here on your left and American Beauty's native plants brand on the right. And you know, if you were a consumer, which display would you choose from? And it's really, um, not the native plants fault, it's just we don't know, didn't know how to grow them in containers, they're smaller pots, we didn't know how to force them for display. Um, propagation was difficult, it's mostly done by seed, which doesn't yield uniform crops. So it seemed like there was a lot of potential to develop new natives or uh, additional natives that, that could be adaptable. So one of the first things that um, we did is we put native shrubs that were not commonly available or widely used in a tough landscape site on the Yukon campus in parking lot islands alongside Barberry and Euonymus. Here's, here they are. And so this was just one site and we had this replicated. And we did the first round in 2010 with those six natives up there. We did another round in 2012 to 2014 with another 
eight native plants and crimson pygmy barberry and compactus euonymus as controls. And when we first put this study in, I thought everything was going to die after the first winter and their barberry and euonymus would be standing. I was really pleasantly surprised that most everything survived and performed well. And so we measured aesthetic quality and survival and things like that. This was a really a tough site when you dug it up. It was largely backfill from the construction of these dorms. It was hot, high light. There's a huge commuter parking lot there called W Lot. In this site, we used another parking lot for round two, part of another parking lot. Um, so not much to, to, to support the plants. So this is um, the aesthetic quality index results for that first study. And you can see the crimson pygmy barberry and euonymus here. And this was aesthetic quality in 2010, 2011, and 2012. And there were you know, several plants like the sweet fern and the sweet gale that right out of the gate performed as well as the invasives. And they, several of them that kind of lagged behind were just as good as the, the barberry and euonymus by the third year. And so that was, you know, make a good recommendation that these would can certainly be alternatives for barberry and euonymus in tough sites. So I want to talk about some of these plants because with some of these plants, I, I took the research a step further and looked at propagation and production in containers, media and fertility and shading and that kind of thing. So I'm going to talk about a few of these. Then I'll show you the results of the second parking lot and then talk about some of those and that's kind of how it's going to flow. Okay. Okay, so Comptonia peregrina, I don't know if I, I saw some of these natives on campus. I don't know if I saw this one, um, but I believe it's here. Um, the sweet fern is um, a really interesting plant. It's a pioneer plant. It um, fixes nitrogen in the soil through these um, root nodules and the franchia bacteria that fixes nitrogen. So it comes in after a forest fire or after a clearing and it rejuvenates the soil for other plants to then come in. So it's very adaptable to dry, gravelly, nutrient deficient soils like you see in a parking lot island or a commercial landscape site. So these are the plants in the parking lot. Um, this was at the bus stop location. There it is right next to the winged euonymus. So it's a nice dense plant when full sun. And some people uh, say that it's not that long lived, but this is going into its sixth season. It gets to that, you know, three to four foot height, nice and compact, dense. It has a wonderful fragrance to the foliage, especially on a warm, sunny day. So you can, it smells like Cinnabon in the parking lot, which you wouldn't expect, but uh, a really interesting plant. Here it is kind of being used as a hedgerow at coastal Maine botanical gardens or a shrubby ground cover under trees. This was a neat parking lot at a Lowe's in Maine um, or kind of as a naturalizing. I think that the sweet fern is a real sweetheart plant for a lot of people, but the problem with it has been propagation. It's difficult to propagate. So it doesn't produce a lot of seeds. The seeds need smoke or fire to break their dormancy. And um, it, you can't take, readily take stem cuttings, softwood stem cuttings in the traditional sense. Uh, so it's largely propagated by digging up sods, dividing the rhizomes. So one of the first studies that I did as an assistant professor leaving Barberry behind was look at media for doing rhizome divisions. And um, we used vermiculite and uh, a Fafford mix and sand, and it was, it was very easy to propagate from divisions. You could take small two-inch segments and, and get plants. These are actually the plants that I raised up and put in the parking lot island a couple of years later. And I'm still working with this plant. I had an undergrad last year do some uh, stem cuttings from very young shoots. So when they get to be no more than three inches tall coming up from the rhizome and more recently shown that it'll work from shoots as well. But very young stems root readily with an IBA auxin. And they can make nice dense plants and you can even get re-sprout after you take cuttings from the rhizomes. And this is the data from that work which is not yet published. 
Um, and just showing that we use two different propagation systems. We used an intermittent mist, just straight putting it in the mist with a little bit of a, with a, a covering over it for shade. It was just kind of like an upside down flat. And we used a, a propagation dome, a clear dome. And the mist worked a lot better. I mean, 98% rooting for Comptonia is wonderful. Um, the dome didn't do too bad, about 70% rooting. What happened with the dome was, um, the tips would dry out a little bit. It wasn't as, as humid in there, and that actually promoted lateral branching. So we got slightly larger plants with the dome, but better rooting with the mist, so you could perhaps recommend rooting in mist and, and pinching to get greater branching. And then we grew them out in containers, and 3,000, 1,000 to 3,000 IBA, maybe a little bit higher, um, you can get you know 80% or more rooting. And I uh, found uh, developing native ours. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. But um, we have raised this um, interesting clone of Comptonia that has a bluish cast to the foliage, a kind of a very uniform margin to the leaf, and um, nice kind of branching and symmetry to the plant. And the University of Connecticut is looking to patent this now to, you know, to get into production about that. Another plant that is also has scented foliage is Mirica pencil. Nope, that's wrong. It should be Mirica gale. Sorry, that's incorrect. Sweet gale is Mirica gale. It's still Mirica, so the bayberry is now Morella, but this is Mirica gale. Um, normally you'd find it in um, around the edge margins of lakes, streams, freshwater mostly. Uh, it has this kind of frosty lime green foliage. It's not, it's deciduous, so it's, it's a cousin of the bayberry. It doesn't have the, um, the berries with the, the candle wax on them. They're a, um, more of a catkin. Um, but here it is growing in the parking lot islands. Here's crimson pygmy barberry. It's a very low plant, one to two feet. It has this kind of arching candelabra-like habit to it. The stems are kind of a brown, purpley brown with yellow, white, yellow lenticels on it. Scented foliage. It tends to be monoecious or dioecious, and there are male and female plants. The clone we had in the parking lot was a male, and the male catkins can be really showy in early spring, very early spring here. This is um, some that we put near my house. I think, and this is two years later, so you can get a nice hedgerow low. Um, I, in the parking lots, I've seen you know birds nest in it. This is actually in Rockland, Maine, near a Marina. So you can see uh, it trying to be used here. A, a landscape architect had a good novel idea there. It's a really cold, hardy plant. I think it's found all the way up, maybe even into Alaska. I've seen some of them. Some of the growers says that. It's very easy to propagate, so I didn't do a lot of studies with this. I just tried it with, you know, Hormid in one. It roots very well. It grows very fast. You could probably go right from a cutting into a number one in one year. You can prune it, shear it, and it, it's very dense. So it's a, it's a, that's what, you know, growers like, something that's fast to grow. It takes a typical bark, peat, sand, media, and control-release fertilizer. So northern bush honeysuckle, Deervilla lanicera. This is, I saw this on campus. I saw the southern sessilifolia and, and this one as well. Um, this was in the parking lot islands. Uh, it's not as popular among nursery growers, but it should be because it's very adaptable. It stays really low. It's a terrific bee plant. Um, so this is me. This was one near my driveway. You can just sit and watch the bumblebees all day. It has these... Um, clusters of tubular yellow flowers at the tips of the shoots, reddish foliage on the new growth. This was in the parking lot. So the first year they didn't look as good because they came, this was in 2010, they came from the nursery and they hadn't been spaced in a timely manner at the nursery. So as soon as we spread them out, the shoots fell over. So it got a poor visible rating, uh, but they 
this basically, they just re-sprouted from the base. And that's one thing you can do with this plant. You can prune it back readily and have it, you know, re-sprout and make a dense plant. And this was, you know, year three. I think we had the cultivar copper, which tends to get really red new growth. There's copper right there at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. This is at, outside of a daycare center in stores, downtown stores, Connecticut. And this is on the Yukon campus. And this is at Coastal Maine. And this is that planting I was looking at the bees at. So it can get a nice fall color. And I saw a huge planting that I'm bigger than I've ever seen on campus here. I don't know what building it was at, but it was a big swath of it. I took a picture. Uh, and this is out a parking lot out in the, uh, Minnesota. So using it a lot out there. The button bush is another one that when people saw this in the parking lots, they were shocked that it would grow because typically it's a plant that you find on the edge of water with its roots submerged in the water. But um, sometimes native plants are adaptable to a niche outside of where you find them. But in those areas, they maybe don't compete, but and they'll do fine in these tougher areas. And so that's where you see them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be used in a landscape in a different way. And that's the case with buttonbush because here it is in the bus stop parking lot island doing quite well in a quick draining, not too wet, but maybe offers a little bit of moisture soil. This is kind of the typical use in a rain garden, um, but it can, it can do well in um, drier sites, maybe not completely dry, but it can do quite well outside of its niche. It's very desirable for its interesting uh, inflorescences, these golf ball sized white flower clusters that attract lots of pollinators. Um, and these fruits kind of persist, they turn a reddish and then a black and they'll persist into the winter. They're very easy to propagate from seed. They don't need any cold stratification or anything like that, but there's a lot of diversity from seed and not so desirable diversity sometimes you know, different leaves, different habits. So if you were a designer, this may not be so desirable for you. And there are some cultivars of this, which is what's really important for this plant to make it in the nursery trade, to have a little bit more symmetry and um, um, stability or predictability. So there's Sputnik, which is a, a, an older cultivar. Sugar Shack, which is a, a really good cultivar, a little bit more compact, three to four feet. Here are some new ones that are not as, as well tested as Sugar Shack. So this is the American filbert, and this is Mark right here, and in the parking lot islands. This is a wild plant. This is just showing the size, because he's about six foot. Um, so it's big. It gets a, a nice fall color. There's two native filberts. There's the American filbert, and there's the beaked filbert, which is Coralus cornuta. It's the Corliss cornuta is the plant that I wanted for the parking lot islands because I thought it had a more finer texture, a little bit more ornamentally pleasing. But this is, they're very difficult to distinguish. And this is what I got from the nursery, American filbert, which we realized about a year later. But it did very well. It had this really, here's the burning bush right there next to it. This nice kind of mix of fall foliage color. The American filbert has this ruffled involucre. Um, and we did find from raising some seed of this, um, a compact form called a little filly. So um, still working on propagation of this. It's not easy. The filberts are not so easy, but uh, we did do a study with the beaked filbert that's coming up. The beaked filbert is the easiest way to distinguish it from the American filbert is by the involucre. So it's shaped more like a duck beak versus kind of the ruffled shirt sleeve. This is it at the Minnesota Botanic Garden or Arboretum. Um, and this one tends to be a little bit more in the colder areas with, than the American, but they, they certainly overlap. And there's other ways you can tell the American filbert apart from the beaked filbert. The fall color, the, the beaked gets more of a yellow. I know it's, these are wild shoots. The catkin size, but they both produce the edible nut, the, the filbert nut. So we did a propagation. We looked at several difficult to root natives, the New Jersey tea. Here's the beaked filbert, um, northern bush honeysuckle, and viburnum acerifolium. 
And we found that you can get pretty good rooting um, if you take cuttings in July, treat them with at least 3,000 parts per million IBA, you can root the beech filbert pretty well. And then we took the plants from this study and some of the others and put them in a container production study. And this was looking at shale as a media amendment, trying to recreate those dry gravelly soils. You see this in along the sides of the roads in Connecticut. And um, it, it didn't really matter. It grew well in all media. So you can use a standard bark peat sand to grow nice looking beaked filberts. So another plant that was not in the parking lot study but was in these propagation studies was maple leaf viburnum, viburnum acerifolium. This is a great shade plant, dry shady conditions. Uh, it's a highly sought after plant for the foliage. It's this maple leaf looking foliage. It gets wonderful fall color. This is a seedling in the woods. Some of the natural history descriptions of these plants are beautiful writing about you know, this plant in this kind of ghostly fall pinkish white yellow color. It, uh, and so it's really sought after by nurserymen as well but it's very hard to propagate. So they buy it in as rooted cuttings or they buy it in as sod, bare root, and um, it, it was hard to, to propagate. It has the typical viburnum flowers, clusters of small white flowers. They're pink in buds, so sometimes you get pink buds and white flowers at the same time, and um, blue-black fruits. And so we did this plant as well. So um, and. We did single node cuttings, and then we also tried two node cuttings and had 100% rooting with two node cuttings. So that's the trick with this plant. The problem is when people are take collecting native plants from the wild, you're not going to readily get a, a vegetative shoot where you can take two node cuttings. You're going to see a, a single node, a pair of leaves, and then a flower. And that roots not as well, more in the like 50-60%. So, um, and also, if you give a plant time in container production, you may find taking cuttings from container plants will yield better results. And sometimes you'll get vegetative shoots when you're growing a plant in a bark peat sand mix with high fertility. It'll go more vegetative, and then you can take cuttings. Um, so we found two nodes, and it's hard to see, but there was there are two nodes on this. This is the grow out after a winter. So we told growers that, hopefully they're trying that. And we also looked at pruning to try to yield a more dense plant in a pot. So people like to get plants that have, you know, nice rounded uniform canopy in a container, not kind of, you know, a pigtail in a pot like a lot of natives look like. And um, so pr you can prune these plants as well to get a more uniform height to width ratio. So this is the second study, the parking lots which were established in 2012. Uh, in this year we had heavy deer pressure, so we used that as a, a measure. We evaluated deer browse or deer herbivory based on the rating system. So here you can see natives like uh, the Prunus pumula variety depressa, the creeping sand cherry, elderberry, the gray dogwood, and round leaf dogwood. We had a uh, spice bush. We had blueberry as kind of a pseudo control and uh, Virginia rose and sweet bells with the same two invasive controls. Um, the blueberry is a plant that from, from day one has been popularized as an alternative for the burning bush but there's a lot of mixed reports on how well it establishes in a tough landscape. It likes acidic soils, and while it's drought tolerant once established, it requires, I find, regular watering to get it established. So you can't just put it in the ground and you set it and forget it like a burning bush. Um, so it was kind of in there, let's see how it did, and it didn't do that well. Um, one of the lowest survival rates after two years, um, it had a little bit of deer brows actually, and you know, not a great aesthetic rating. Whereas plants like this unknown plant, the sweet bells, Eubotris racemosa, used to be Lacothoe racemosa, did really well. The Virginia rose did well. The dogwoods had a quite a bit of deer brows. 
Um, same thing with the spice bush, not the greatest survival, good amount of deer browse. Uh, so I want to talk about this plant, sweet bells, and about the creeping sand cherry and a couple of other plants. So this is the sweet bells. It has bell-shaped flowers with a very light fragrance. Um, it looks kind of like a blueberry, but a little bit denser than a blueberry and a lot tougher than a blueberry, easy to establish. Here are the plants in a parking lot island, and it gets some plants, some ecotypes get really nice red fall color. It's very easy to propagate from cuttings, um, you know, 70 to 88 percent with no hormone. So it's very easy to propagate, which is good for growers. It grows fast in a pot. You can shear it and stick those cuttings at any time. We did a shade production study with these plants and a couple of other species and found, you know, you can grow them right under full sun or under 40% shade, and they will make a nice kind of height to width uniform ratio with a good number of shoots. These are one gallon size pots. In this study, we also looked at hobblebush. Um, and in the propagation study, we looked at hobblebush. So this one wasn't in the parking lot islands because it's a shade plant, kind of like the maple leaf viburnum. It likes cool climates. It likes moist soils, but well-drained. It's kind of picky, but it's a gorgeous plant, a highly sought after plant. Um, it gets these red fruits, these big leaves, fuzzy leaves, a little bit fuzzy, these white lace cap flowers, fuzzy buds. So it's really sought after among native plant enthusiasts, very difficult to propagate from cuttings. And it's um, not that easy from seed. I've never tried it, but that's what I hear. Um, so I don't know if we just came across the right plant in Massachusetts that roots, but we rooted it pretty well. We had, um, you know, 70% rooting with 3,000, 1,000 to 8,000 parts per million IBA. This is what they, they were short little shoots. So one little node, because that's all you can get off of the landscape. Um, so there were these short little shoots that were barely in the media, and these leaves eventually just dried up and came right off over the winter. And this is the outgrowth the following spring. They were potted up before they leafed out or as they were starting to, and here they're, they're growing out. And then we put this plant in that shade study, so a, a typical bark peat sand mix. Um, and they definitely benefit from growing in shade. We had leaf burn in full sun, even some leaf coloring, discoloring in 40% shade, but you can get, you know, a nice looking container plant um, with shade, 70% shade. The creeping sand cherry, um, this is it in the parking lot aisle, so you almost can't tell that it's there, and the um, outside landscaping crew couldn't tell that it was there, so they mowed over it a couple of times, but um, it's a great low, less than a foot plant with these kind of linear leaves that emerge a little bit after the flowers or just as the flowers are emerging. They have a classic kind of rosaceae flower, five petaled white flower, um, silver undersides to the leaves. It can get kind of a red burgundy fall color. This is in our lilac garden on the Yukon campus over some, some slate. So very low growing. This is the the native knoll that we call it at my house, this rocky area, these were one, two, there were three, maybe five of these from a one gallon pot. And this was it maybe last year. So it's a great kind of facer plant or um, along the edge of a driveway or something where you get hot baking sun and it, it'll, it'll do just fine. This is kind of the other view of the rock. That's my son several years ago. So you can see it's kind of like a driveway planting just kind of creeping over for a rock garden. It's very easy to root cuttings. These are actually cuttings from a Canterbury horticulture nursery in Connecticut, and you can get nice, dense one gallon pots. This is a, a cultivar that Mark developed. Mark's sitting right there, he's from Yukon. He uh, crossed Prunus pumula variety depressa and Prunus susquehannae. So it's a, it's a creeping plant with a little bit larger leaf the same white flowers and red fall color, 
grows really well in a container, and the uh, university, I think, is looking to patent this plant as well. So, you know, native plants that behave well in a landscape and um, still offer wildlife benefits, I think, is what the nursery industry is looking for now. Um, this plant, deerberry, is one that I've been working on recently, and I have a paper coming out in Native Plants Journal this fall on micropropagation. So deerberry um, has a pretty broad native range. It can be really big, and it can get more compact, like this specimen here. It's in the blueberry group, but it doesn't produce sweet-tasting fruits. They're edible, but not really palatable. But it is being um, used in blueberry breeding to introduce kind of exotic flavors and colors and um, upland adaptation. So it's, it's drought, more drought tolerant. So this is kind of at my house by a rock here. And these are some of the ornamental features. This is from the publication, which is why it's all labeled up like this. You know, you get these kind of star-like flowers uh, in abundance. You get the fruit is usually starts out greenish to blue, and then it turns these kind of um, burgundy, orangey colors. It can get nice red fall color like the blueberries do. It does not root well from cuttings at all. Um, so that's what we tried first with poor root systems. And then we thought, let's try it in tissue culture. And we looked at different iron supplements in tissue culture, because sometimes the leaves looked a little chlorotic. And we did rooting. And it, it propagates you know, with 80% success from, from micropropagation. So that's one way to go about it for breeders or growers looking for this plant. Here they are acclimating in a salad tray, acclimating to the greenhouse, and these are one gallon containers. So um, I'm still working with native plants. Um, I have a grad student right now looking at pollinator visitation on native shrubs and their cultivars. So, Native plants, when I first started working with them, they were desirable as alternatives to invasives. And now when the pollinator concern and worry hit, it was all about we need native plants for pollinators. And then you started to hear some groups saying that the cultivars of native plants were not as supportive of pollinators as the wild type species. And you know that concerns growers and that's not really based in scientific studies. So, we did a study, we collected some native shrubs, species and their cultivars and put them in a planting behind our greenhouse. And this is my master's student, Jacob, and he's counting insect visitation. And um, this work is, is wrapping itself up, so hopefully we'll get, get this out soon. And, and most of the cultivars are very good at supporting pollinators. There's a few that have dramatic changes like a flower color, um, that, that maybe attract a different suite of pollinators, um, but not always. And um, many of the cultivars that just exhibit a more compact habit attract just as many pollinators of the same type, and some even have greater floral density and attract more pollinators. So, um, another thing I'm working on is looking at developing um, local native cultivars, so looking at local ecotypes and which ones exhibit the best ornamental qualities and adaptability, because this is a Eubotris racemosa from Connecticut, and this is a Eubotris racemosa from Connecticut, and one clearly is more, you know, you know, I think, you know, Pride's Corner would be more interested in picking up this plant than this one, and they're certainly more interested in growing them vegetatively so they can offer a uniform crop than from seed, so which is not, it just germinates well, but they're itty bitty bitty seeds with this plant so it's kind of a pain to deal with them in a plug tray and that's it by one o'clock i think that was right yeah. so any questions <laughs> yes uh, yeah i really enjoyed your presentation uh i noticed most i mean maybe 80 percent of Whereas the soil mm -hmm. um, is not the whole world. Right. Uh, and if you're in this part of New York, uh, for an soil, pH 7.75 to 8.2, and many of us will not do well at all. I wonder if you wanted to look at some of the pH issues. Some of them will do fine with 
many of the ones you just mentioned are totally uh, totally focused, uh, just to go downhill. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe that should be tested, you know, because maybe they will tolerate outside. I don't know if you put them in and they haven't done well there here, according to the native maps. So but the native maps are really general. In, okay. Well, I think that with native plants, it, it is going to be a regional issue. So, I mean, there are some plants that have a really broad range, but that's one of the issues with the whole patenting cultivar process and trying to get our tech transfer people to realize that you can't necessarily market these plants across you know, the nursery industry like you can a barberry. So it, with native selections, it's going to be a more regional focus. Um, I mean, regional, but also just soil creation. Right. So if you grow them, if you had to ask the soil here, the hardiness is not an issue. But, uh, and it's not Connecticut versus New York, it's just a soil issue apparently. Yeah, well, like even on the. No, if somebody's like, well, has red corn and that's a really broad range, and other plants, but many of them, especially the New England plants, is America, California, I mean, they're just really sensitive to Yeah, I think that on the western half of Connecticut, they have more limestoney soils as well. But some of the plants might do okay, like this. I didn't include the spirea. But the tomentosa is being looked at in the Midwest, and they've done actually, I think, some pH studies in Minnesota, maybe with that plant. Yeah, the tomentosa. So that's one. So maybe some of these others, but yeah, it, it has been a more kind of um, pH. Yeah, okay. We'll consider that. Thank you. I'm wondering if your work of uh, the and the pollinators, did you distinguish? Uh, the native versus alien pollinators? So uh, sure could hear okay. questions. Okay. Oh, okay. So with the pollinators, were there native and non-native pollinators? Yeah. So, I mean, we looked at the honeybees, and, uh, which is not native. And, um, and yeah, I think he looked at, I mean, for some things, I think he had about, he has about 12 insect groups. So he had like hoverflies and mining bees and, um, bumblebees, honeybees, and then he had smaller groupings, you know, like other flies, um, sweat bees. So he had maybe three or four bee groups and then a couple of fly groups. And then he had like an other group. He had the butterflies and, you know, moth group, which he didn't see that much of, but he didn't look at night. So, um, well, like, like with Aronia, for example, we looked at a wild representative Aronia, and then we looked at two compact cultivars of Aronia, which really didn't have a change in flower color, and there was n no significant difference in the insect visitation on a compact form. In fact, um, with Clethera, we looked at ruby spice, we looked at a wild type, and then we looked at hummingbird, and hummingbird actually produces more flowers per square the area of plant and it had more pollinators in some of the insect categories. But the ruby spice differed in a couple of maybe one situation, not much difference there. We looked at potentilla, the wild potentilla, um, goldfinger and pink beauty and we saw differences there. We saw differences between the purple and the green nine bark and some differences with hydrangea. We looked at Annabelle which is largely sterile florets. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. The nursery industry tends to be fairly conservative. So I'm wondering what successes you've had in introducing these native uh, shrubs to the nursery industry and what methods you've used to try to attract them to. Good question. So um, how am I bringing these plants to the growers? So I did have a grant that allowed me to propagate and give them plants to trial and recruit growers to uh, an advisory group. So I worked with about five growers directly, Pride's Corner Farms, Canterbury Hort, Planner's Choice, Broken Hour, which is more of kind of a specialty plant design build, and um, Summerhill. And so um, 
I gave them the plants to trial and then I repeatedly asked for feedback and I visited the nursery. And I think probably about three or four species have been added. So they like the Prunus pumula. They like, um, I have a Viburnum lantanoides. Um, no, sorry, not lantanoides. That one, I don't know if they were, I used that, I gave that to a couple of specialty nurseries. So the Viburnum cassinoides or Nudum cassinoides, that one, um, America Gale, they're growing. Um, they had been growing Comptonia, and I'm holding a grower workshop this winter for the new propagation method from cuttings. So hopefully hands-on, we'll, we'll, we'll dig sod, four shoots, and let them, the head propagators, stick the cuttings and then see rooted plants. And um, let's see, but they are, like the big nurseries are looking for selections of natives now. So, Prides and Monrovia and, um, um, you know, like the Bailey and um, Spring Me Meadow, they, they are looking for selections. So if you have unique germplasm of a native, I think that's the way they want to go with a, with a cultivar selection. Because the consumer wants a named plant, it's a small group of consumers that want a wild type plant. Um, so. So I think about three or four species and that the species may vary slightly. So one of the plants that I really like is round leaf dogwood and it's, in, it's showing a lot of promise with drought tolerance and um, just one grower was just not interested in it. And then another, one of the growers got the prunus, I don't know what he did with it. And then all of a sudden now he's got people asking for it. People ask me and I said, well, go try this grower who actually grew and they asked me, where can I get it? But didn't I give it to you? But then, I said, oh, I think Canterbury still has some. And he went and got it from there. So it takes a while to catch on. Certainly takes a while. And then, and then they're like, oh, yeah, we should be growing that. People are asking for that now. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Did you say that cultivated plants are significant in maintaining insect uh, or pollinator populations? Um, I think they certainly will support nectar foraging pollinators, that's what I've looked at. We haven't looked at the underside of the leaves for the larvae or the caterpillars, and that, that certainly could be done. You could look at night foraging pollinators as well, which Jacob's not a night person, and I've recruited someone for that. But um, so we just wanted to look a, a little bit, just try to provide a little bit of science to people as they make their decisions and what's the best for their landscape. So, I mean, if you're doing restoration, you know, you don't want to necessarily put ruby spice in, not that it didn't derive as a sport and may, may you know, be out there. Um, I, I, I think they certainly can. I think a lot of non-natives can as well. But um, so I think they, they can support natives quite well, uh, insects quite well. Well, thank you. More questions, thanks again. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.